Well, I want to welcome everyone here this evening. And um, for announcements, well, you can look at your bulletins. I know there's several Friday evening studies meeting this week. And um, there is no Sunday school this morning. I speak truth. There was no Sunday. Anyway, sorry. Yes. Up to date, Pastor. So with that, let's take a few moments um, to prepare our hearts with silent prayer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Please stand. Let's pray. O oh, our great triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. You have done wondrous things in our salvation by grace through faith in your Son, even bringing us into your glorious kingdom, a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And truly, you are worthy of all worship and praise and glory and honor. Enable us by your renewing grace to offer to you acceptable worship this evening. Fill us with reverence for you, and may we be filled with awe, for you truly are an awesome God in the fullness of the meaning of awesome. Lift our hearts to you in worship. Build us up through your means of grace. Encourage us, prepare us for the week ahead that we might live for your glory, that we might trust Christ morning, noon, and night. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, let's now go before our God in confession of sin. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings, and remembrance of them is a grievous to us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter seek to serve and please you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. If you would now please take your hymnals, let's turn to number 170, Fairest Lord Jesus, please stand. <laughs> Thank you. 
And if you'd look in the back of your hymnals, on page 873, we will find our affirmation of faith for this evening. Page 873, question 67. Well, that number is outdated. 67, um, page 874. Page 874, questions. My bulletin's messed up. What questions do you have? 67 to 68? 67 through 69, thank you. Um, page 874, question 67 through 69. Question 67, what is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, thou shalt not kill. 68, what is required in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment requires all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life in the life of others. And question 69, what is forbidden in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment forbiddeth the taking away of our own life or the life of our neighbor unjustly or whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Scripture reading as we are now working our way through the book of Revelation. We will be finishing up Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one, like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash about his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth, came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. 
But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, maker and preserver of all things visible and invisible. We adore you in your infinite majesty and bless you for your wondrous love revealed in Jesus Christ, your son, our savior. We give thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Almighty and merciful Father, restore our souls in Jesus Christ, that we may be merciful and kind, even as you are. Let your forgiveness make us willing to forgive all wrongs which we have suffered and to ask forgiveness for every wrong which we have done. Let our love and charity be abundant as our joy, that our hearts may be tender to all need and our hands give freely for his sake. And we ask that you who have founded the church and have promised to dwell in her forever, enlighten and sanctify it, we beseech you, by your word and spirit. Empower all pastors and ministers with your grace, that with joy and assurance they may guard and feed your sheep, looking to the great shepherd and bishop of our souls. Bless all who serve you in the rule of the church, in the care of the poor, in the ministry of praise, and in the teaching of your people. Strengthen them in their labors. Give them courage to witness a good confession and cause your church to increase more and more that every knee may bow before you and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And furthermore, Lord, just as you taught your disciples, teach us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, please turn with me to the book of Psalms to specifically Psalm number 15, Psalm 15, and please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Hear now God's word from the book of Psalms, Psalm 15, a Psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Well, let's pray. 
Lord Almighty, um, in this psalm, a vital question is asked um, in verse 1. And really to, to understand the answer to this vital question, who shall sojourn in your tent, who shall dwell on your holy hill, for us to really understand it and understand it even in Christ, we need your Holy Spirit working upon our thinking, our minds, our hearts, our living, our faith. And so I pray that you would empower the preaching of your word, that we might understand this psalm, understand its implications all the more. And I seek the unction of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, we live in a unique time in history in which we as a society are lacking something which has been a feature of all societies on down through history. Throughout history, societies and cultures have been very conscious of the idea of deity. And they have had a strong sense of the existence of either God or gods. And when you're aware of the existence of deity, then certain pressing questions become very important, not just to you individually, but those pressing questions become important to society as a whole, questions which we've lost. How can we avoid angering God or the gods? How can we please God or please the gods? And how can we secure their favor and blessing? But here we are in our so-called modern age, which is more characterized by what Nietzsche has to say about the death of God rather than that haunting question, how shall I please the true and living God? What Nietzsche was referring to by that expression that he uses, the death of God, is that we as a society have lost our belief in God and especially our belief in the Christian God. We've lost our belief in a creator who sustains the order of the cosmos, and who establishes what is right and wrong. In a very real sense, we are in a, a moral freefall, and there seems to be no bottom to this freefall that we're in. We have come to believe that this material world is all that there is, and that there's nothing more. Nietzsche wrote, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? The death of God in Western civilization has had a, a number of ramifications involving not only our loss of moral bearings, which we see in the battles going on right now, in our society, but also we have lost a fear of deity, a dread of holiness. Whereas in the past, men and women asked, how can I become right with a holy God? The question is now, and I'm even including many Christians, um, it's radically shifted along the lines of how can God and, and church meet my needs? And how can this church and its service please me? We've gone from God-centered to man-centered, even in the church. Too often, we possess little concept of the pressing priorities of a holy God and what he seeks from all who trust in him. In other words, the great question that 
Psalm 15 is seeking to answer is, how should God's people live in light of the holiness of the God to whom we've been reconciled? How shall we then live? Now, King David, the author here of Psalm 15, lived in a radically different world, a radically different time. He lived in a world in which no matter where you went, people possessed a strong awareness of deity and that it's deity who needed to be pleased, not men. And for the Jew, the question of the, the holiness of God and man's unfitness to enter into the presence of a holy God, that, that was a pressing question. It was a pressing problem. Verse 1, O oh, Yahweh, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? We need to recapture these kinds of soul-searching concerns, even as Christians, even as God's people. Now, embedded deep in the consciousness of the Israelites were biblical stories, stories of Moses and the burning bush, where God said to Moses, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Let that sort of a holy God sink into your heart and your mind and your thinking. And then Jews also um, were raised with the fearsome story found in Exodus, Exodus chapter 19, where Israel is assembled before Mount Sinai with, with Yahweh manifesting his presence at the top of that mountain. And we read there in Exodus 19, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp sat back and relaxed and said, hey, dude, how's it going? To God, absolutely not, absolutely not. So that all the people in the camp trembled. They trembled with dread at the sheer magnificent holiness of God. And then you read in verse 21, and Yahweh said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to Yahweh and look and many of them perish. And who can forget the troubling story of Uzzah? Do you remember Uzzah? They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and they, they, they missed um, the Pentateuch's instructions, how you move the Ark of God. God is, is so, so holy. And his Ark is so holy because God is holy. And, and missing those instructions, instead of doing what they were supposed to do, was what was put poles through the rings on that Ark. And then the priests, the Levites, were to carry that Ark on their shoulders with the poles. Instead, they took the Ark and they placed the Ark in an ox cart. And then the oxen, as they're moving the, the ark to Jerusalem, the oxen stumbled. And the ark was in danger with that stumbling of falling into the dirty dirt. And so Uzzah did what we probably would do. He reached out his hand to steady the ark. And you know what God did? He struck Uzzah dead on the spot. And of course, the pressing question that that story raises is, which is truly unholy, dirty dirt or sinful man? Which really is unholy? So because of this awareness of God's holiness and man's unholiness, it was natural for David to ask a great and pressing question, a question involving even God's people. Um, verse 1 again here in Psalm 15. O Yahweh, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Of course, the, the tent there is a reference to the tabernacle. 
which was the portable temple that was used in the wilderness and for some quite some time afterwards, that was the place where you would go to meet God. And David's reference to your holy hill here is referring to Mount Zion upon which the temple was built and which became the place then where you would go to meet with God. So, again, that pressing question, who really is fit to enter into God's holy presence and fellowship with him? Please understand, this is not about justification. As, as Reformed folk, that's immediately where our minds go. It's a really important teaching. That's not what this is about. David is not asking, how can a lost sinner become right with a holy God? Of course, the answer to that particular question is the only way that we can become right with a holy God is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his saving work on the cross. That's how we're justified. But again, that's not the question being asked here in verse 1. The question which David is asking has to do with the person who is trusting in the Savior, in Jesus Christ. What about the believer? That's what this question is about. Should, for example, should the temple priests allow anyone and everyone who claims to believe into the temple? Think about that for a moment. Should, should the priests just allow anyone into the temple? Let's say um, there's a man, uh, let's say a Jew, Old Testament days, who was a businessman. And let's say that he was known far and wide as a swindler, a thief in his business dealings, and, and one who even openly admitted that. But at the same time, he also believes he's okay with God because all of his sins are forgiven. He's been offering sacrifices. With such a person like that in mind, let's ask the question that David is asking even though that man is trusting in the Messiah, is he really and truly fit to enter into the presence of God because of his blatant and willful sin? Or you can even approach the question from, from this angle. Would such a man be fit to become a priest? Would we accept him today as a minister of the gospel in the church? Should we allow such a man to serve communion? E. Calvin Beisner writes, For the pious, God-fearing Israelite dwelling with Jehovah in his tabernacle on the holy hill of Zion was a grave matter. No one must presume his own worthiness. Everyone must take special care to see whether he was suited to that privilege, lest, entering unworthily, he should offend the God of the covenant and die. So look with me at the list of character qualities that David lays out here in the body of verse 15. We're not going to examine those. That, that's, that's material for, for another sermon one day on Psalm 15. But, but when you look at those character qualities, verses 2 through 5, um, you could break those down into two broad categories. How one lives their life outwardly as well as the state of one's own inward integrity. Um, who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and who speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. With such character qualities in mind, if you were to go over to the New Testament and look, let's say, at the Sermon on the Mount, um, Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6, the book of James, well, you begin to realize that even the New Testament in the New Testament, God still desires holy conduct from his people. And of course, that flowing out of 
a renewed heart. The big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not God's standards of holiness for the lives of his people. Because that has not changed. The big difference really is that of Pentecost, where we now possess the indwelling Holy Spirit to empower holy living and enable real change and growth. And this truly is good news. Because the resurrection power of Christ is at work in all those who believe. That's Ephesians chapter 1. That really is good news. This, this kind of holy living that we find here, um, holy living flowing out of the work of God in the heart of the believer, well, that's even dealt with um, by Peter in 1 Peter. Let me read from verses 14, 15. What do we have here? 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, 1 Peter 1. Peter writes, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Understand, that's a quote from the Old Testament brought into the New Testament for New Testament Christians. Be holy, for I am holy. Peter continues. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. There's really no difference in the conduct God expects between the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Or perhaps another way to understand that God really does require a life which seeks to obey his commands as imperfectly as our obedience is it may be in order to enter into his holy presence. Um, consider the Lord's Supper. While the Lord's Supper is for struggling sinners who are trusting in Jesus Christ at the very same time, do we not, as we call it, fence the table? Do we not? When the minister fences the table, he is warning those, both those who do not believe, but he's also warning those who profess to believe in Christ, but at the same time, while professing to believe in Christ, they are persisting in pursuing sin with no remorse, and no desire to be rid of that sin. And so when we're fencing the table, we're warning such people it's not safe to partake. Just as Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 11, that's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You see, these are still serious matters even for the, shall I say, New Covenant, New Testament Christian. So again, the great question which David is asking in this psalm has to do with those who do profess faith. These, this has to do with God's people. And as James Boyce observes, this is the question David was also asking when he composed the 15th psalm inquiring, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? That is... What is the character of the person that God approves? Or we could also say, how must we live to enjoy the fullness of fellowship with God? There, I think Boyce, in commenting on this psalm, really hits the nail on the head, encompassing both verse 1 and the end of verse 5. How must we live to enjoy the fullness of a fellowship with God. Boyce continues commenting on this psalm. Justification is by the work of Christ. But if a person has really been justified, he or she will necessarily begin to keep the moral law, moving increasingly in this direction. This is because no one is ever justified apart from regeneration 
And regeneration means that the Spirit of God is at work in us to bring us into increasing conformity to the character of Christ. Unquote. And then one more thing. If you look at the very end of verse 5 here in Psalm 15, you'll discover that Holy Spirit empowered, godly, Christ-like living comes with that wonderful promise which Boyce is referring to, he who does these things shall never be moved. At the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus attached a similar promise regarding obedient, godly living, along with the threat for disobedient, ungodly living. Jesus says, again, end of the Sermon on the Mount, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So on the one hand, our justification, our acceptance with God is based on Christ's work on the cross and his God-pleasing righteousness. Never is our justification based upon our performance, our works, what we do. Justification is, is an act of God. But at the same time, we need to realize that Christ saves us unto holy living. Do you see that? It's not we're saved and then we just go off and do as we want because we're forgiven. That's known as antinomianism, being against the law. No, Christ saves us and we receive the spirit and the spirit's power and the power of the resurrection unto holy living. That's what Paul is getting at in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 to 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the weakness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Do you see that? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Derek Thomas comments on verse 4 here in Romans 8 in this way. Christians whose sins are forgiven now live in holy, obedient gratitude for the grace they have received. Grateful law-keeping is the saved sinner's response to received grace. The rest of our lives are a way of saying thank you. I'll close by once again quoting from James Boyce and his commentary here on Psalm number 15. He writes, Here then is the portrait of one who pleases God. It is a picture of the virtues God wants to see in you. Does he see them? Are they developing in you? They must be if you are his. But notice, if you aspire to this, the psalm ends with an encouraging promise for you. It says, he who does these things will never be shaken. This means, in response to the opening question, that not only will such a person dwell in God's sanctuary on his holy hill, in addition, nothing will ever shake him or her out of it. If you are God's, you may be shaken, but you will never be shaken loose. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to recover not only an ongoing awareness, sense of deity, your existence, your holiness, your presence, but also help us to take your holiness seriously and seek your grace, seek your empowering to live holy lives just as Jesus teaches us to live, the Apostle Paul teaches us to live, 
the Apostle John teaches us to, to live. Peter teaches us to live. Your word from beginning to end teaches us, exhorts us, encourages us, demands that we live. So enable us to not only take these matters seriously, but give us a heart that wants to pursue holiness, to live according to your word, according to your law. We praise these things. We pray for these things. We pray for this change in our heart. We pray for your power. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.